Good morning and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Dave Deacon and we're coming to you from the South Central Research Station near Chickasha, where producers are gathering for the Summer Forge Field Day. We'll have more on that later in the show. But first, we had the opportunity to meet up with David Merberger earlier in the week to get an overview of how the 2017 wheat crop turned out. Overall, I mean, we had a, a pretty good crop mm -hmm. considering some of the battles that we faced, we faced along the way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there were a few hard reminders for some producers al along the growing season with some certain things that we saw. And, and to kind of start out at the beginning, we had some rain in, in uh, the end of August that got some producers who were wanting to target more fall forage given where the commodity prices were when we came into the, to the growing season. And unfortunately, we were getting a lot of good fall forage at the time. We had good soil moisture conditions, but that was also good forage for fall armyworm. So we were battling that insect pest. Areas of southwestern Oklahoma and that earlier planted wheat on susceptible varieties, we had quite a bit of hessian fly that, that we were seeing. But o overall, um, the growing season got off to a pretty good start considering what they were facing earlier on there. And then kind of moving through winter, it was a mild winter overall. And uh, we got the, grow the, the spring green up going pretty early this year, almost two weeks earlier than, than normally we'll normally see here in Oklahoma mm -hmm. and for producers who were grazing and were in a dual purpose system I think we we limited ourselves a little bit on our grain yield potential because we were trying to squeeze out as many days of grazing as we could because it was so early and producers didn't think man I shouldn't be pulling my cattle off right now when actually given the growing conditions we needed to be pulling those cattle off or we were limiting our, our maximum yield potential. Another hard reminder from this past year about nitrogen and just nitrogen fertilizer and um, producers want to cut inputs wherever they could given the commodity price right. at the time and unfortunately nitrogen was probably one of those that was on the chopping block and not put having that fertilizer out there probably limited us in some areas on our on our protein levels as we move towards the next planting season almost already I can't believe that what 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 are some of the what are some of the things producers need to be thinking about whenever they're a selecting variety and b selecting a planting date Great question. Yeah, it's already not too, it's not too early to already think about the next next growing season. Yeah. That's going to be here before we know it. But uh, yeah, some of the things you just mentioned there. One, variety selection. We've got all of our variety trial results up on the wheat.okstate.edu website if you're looking to try to try a different variety. Know what your variety brings to the table and the things that you're trying to battle out in your field. So low pH, different types of disease resistance. And then thinking about fertility going into to next year pH is usually an issue for a lot of people. Pull a soil sample, see where your P and K levels are. You might not put anything down. Way to save some money. Nitrogen fertilizer. I would, uh, <laughs> that's, if, we, if we can put on some nitrogen up front, that's gonna help us, especially on the fall forage. I'd, I'd challenge producers to try an enriched strip. I know Dr. Arnell is really pushing that last year and he's gonna continue pushing that again this year. Cause also trying to, one, get our maximum yield potential and to try to get us some uh, adequate protein protein levels moving in for for next year's wheat crop and also scouting mm -hmm. comes back to knowing your variety and being out there and seeing do you have insect pressure and then also the diseases and if you have a variety like a ruby lee which is very susceptible to some of our foliar diseases be out there scouting and be willing to pull the trigger on a fungicide application to help protect that that top end yield potential that a variety like ruby lee has to offer so really doing all the research now can help the crop in, in September. Absolutely. Okay, thank you much, David. And for a link to the variety trial results, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Last week on the Cow-Calf Corner, we visited with you about the importance of testing some of these summer annual hay crops, uh, forage sorghums, uh, for the possibility of accumulating high levels of nitrate and doing that testing before we harvest. One of the things through the years that has been uh, written about and certainly uh, present in some of the coffee shop talk has been the concept of different times of day that we harvest this 
having effect on the nitrate that's in the plant. And to, to give you some of the logic behind that, the thought always was that during the nighttime, the nitrates were accumulating, and then during the daytime, when photosynthesis and plant metabolism was taking place, that it would utilize the, the nitrate, turn it into protein, and therefore lower the nitrate concentration throughout the day. Well, nothing to do, but let's go ahead and test that theory. Several years ago, uh, we at Oklahoma State University utilized five different farms across the uh, central and western part of, of Oklahoma. And what we did was take samples from a forage sorghum field on five different farms at two hour intervals, starting at 8 a.m. in the morning all the way to 6 p.m. in the evening. And we did that all across the field. We had quadrants laid out to where we took samples from, from all over the field, each uh, sample, uh, the samples being taken every two hours. Then we sent them all to the uh, Soil and Water Forage Testing Laboratory here at Oklahoma State University to, to get the nitrate content that was in those forage samples. What we found, and no great surprise to me, was that there was tremendous difference in the nitrate concentration from the different farms. One farm, for instance, had an average of only 412 parts per million, which is virtually negligible. Hardly any nitrate in the forages at all. One farm averaged almost 9,000 parts per million across all of the samples. That meant some of those samples were in that area that we consider potentially lethal at 10,000 parts per million and above. But as we looked at all five farms, none of them showed any difference in terms of uh, being uh, important differences by time of day. In other words, there was no advantage to cutting later in the day versus earlier in the day on any of the five farms. And so I want to make that point real clear so that we don't have that false sense of security that by harvesting this later in the day that we'll suddenly be safe from nitrate toxicity. That's just not the case. The research proves that it just didn't change that much through the course of a day in any of those five fields, so we want to keep that in mind. We still want to go back to what we talked about last week. Let's go ahead and test the crop before we cut it. That way we'll have a better chance of harvesting something that will be safe for us to feed next winter. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. We're at the Summer Forage Field Day near Chickasha this week, where producers have the opportunity to learn about different ways to grow a better forage in Oklahoma. Uh, it's been a long time that here in Oklahoma State University, especially in the Southwest, we don't have a field day like that, showing like how far it's the new, and also some of the old ones are performing here in, in Southwest of Oklahoma. We've had uh, a great turnout for this Forge Field Day, which is one of our first in, in many, many years. And uh, we're kind of highlighting what's going on here at Chickasha. Uh, other research stations have their unique qualities, and Chickasha Station is known for our forages. There are lots of new plants there. For instance, now we are talking about taff. And we are showing here some plots that we plant some taff and discussing how to manage that in the southwest. Right now, we're, we're showing our cover crops, and uh, which it relates to a yield on our wheat grain yield. So it f falls in there because a lot of people like to use those cover crops as forages. I look at my pastures, they are dry and I'm planting those cover crops, they are pretty green, why not I go there and graze? I would say, okay, might be a good idea, but we need to take care about toxicities and also how easy is to establish cover crops after wheat. So it makes great sense to go ahead and do research and develop data that supports our local producers and that forage base. Uh, at times we've had it and then Oklahoma State has been through some changes and we didn't have it, but we're coming back in full force and providing that research data in a more practical sense to what the producers are wanting now. I am making here my research home like where most of my research is going to be developed. This part of the state is pretty much forage based and also we have a great facility and I'm trying to take the most of this facility information for the producers. The purpose of this station and field day and this research is, is to fill that need of 
what producers are actually doing in the field. Crop marketing specialist Kim Anderson joins us now. Kim, uh, funds had a little bit of a pessimistic outlook. Uh, going forward, things might have changed a little bit. Well, if you look uh, back a couple of months, uh, the funds were short uh, somewhere around 650 million bushels. In the, the last couple of months, they bought 1.3 billion bushels of uh, wheat. They're now, if you look at the hard wheat, the uh, Chicago soft wheat and the spring wheat contracts, they're probably long around 650 million bushels. So they've changed position. They're, you could classify it as optimistic, but I'd say it was cautiously optimistic at the present time. So what's been the price reaction? Well, if you look at the cash prices, uh, you know, go back to when harvest began in Oklahoma, somewhere around 375, somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, we peaked out on July the 11th at uh, around $4.80 hit five dollars in a couple locations there and they backed off about 50 cents now to 425 to 430. Uh, you look at that September uh, Kansas City uh, contract or KC contract uh, we're right at five dollars uh, and if we pop that five then we'll probably go on down but uh, you know the prices are normally like a pendulum if they're going up they go up a little too high and they have to back off if they're going down they go down too far and they have to back off so we, we saw that pendulum swing. So it, why did that pendulum swing? Why didn't that price rally continue? Well, if you look at the negative factors that's going in the market, we had the rally because of, well, the loss of the spring wheat crop in uh, northern United States and, and, can and Canada, shortage of uh, protein wheat. Uh, our, pro our wheat's a good milling wheat, but it's short protein. And so there's some negative factors in the market. If you look at foreign wheat production, yeah, we, we've got uh, we had 2.3 billion bushels of uh, wheat production in the United States last year, just under 1.8 billion this year. Uh, you look at the hard red winter wheat, we had over a billion bushel production last year, uh, less than 800 million this year. So we're lower there, but if you look at the foreign crop, it's almost uh, equal to the record uh, foreign wheat crop that we had last year. And I think the funds and, and the markets looking at this excess amount of wheat, we got lots of wheat, we just don't have milling quality wheat and that's spelled out by protein. You know, going forward, wheat's in the bin, producers are, you know, it's already time to start thinking about next year's wheat crop. What's some things that producers should start thinking about? What got us that dollar and a half price increase this year? We was talking about it this time last year. We said, if you produce a quality product, prices will go up. We got a product that, that's good milling quality. It's got good test weight. It gives them good flour yield. We just need protein. And we got a buck and a half increase in our prices from that. If we'd have had protein, we'd have had another, oh, 75, 80 cent price increase. Looking forward to 18, produce a quality product, get them test weight, get them good milling characteristics, and get them protein, and you're gonna have $5 or six, five fifty to $6 dollar wheat next year. As we said, if they'll produce a quality product, they'll have a price next year. All right, thanks, Kim. We'll see you next week. Good morning, everyone. Al Sutherland is off again this week, so you have me solo. And of course, we're gonna start right away with the newest drought monitor map. So let's see what we have. Well, you can probably tell it hasn't rained a lot. If you're lucky, you probably got a little bit of rain, but um, lack of rain and summer usually means increasing drought or dry conditions. And that's exactly what we see this week. Um, the abnormally dry, that yellow on the map has increased in north central, uh, down into parts of central Oklahoma. Um, we just got rid of that area a couple of weeks ago, so we're right back into the fire there. And the D1 has increased just a little bit out in the Panhandle um, and a little bit in central Oklahoma. So uh, changes going on in the drought um, with the lack of rainfall and the summer heat. We can see that rainfall. This is the seven day rainfall accumulation. And you can see lots of white and uh, light blue on that map. There are some good areas, the green up in uh, northwest Oklahoma, um, Dewey and Custer County's got some rain. Look out there in the Panhandle. Kenton got 4.69 inches of rain in just a couple of days. That's incredible for those folks. That's not only one of the wettest two-day periods for them, uh, that's also one of the wettest months in their history. So um, a lot of rainfall up there, no worries. Um, and again, some good rainfall up in northeast Oklahoma and scattered around here and there. 
Why is the drought still here? Well, we showed last week that departure from normal for the last 60 days. Again, this is through July 17th. Um, we can see uh, deficits of uh, two to as many as uh, seven inches scattered about the northwestern half of the state. There are some uh, green areas thrown in there where they've gotten a little bit extra rainfall. And of course, the southeastern half of the state where they've gotten uh, lots of good rainfall over the last 60 days and so no drought worries there at least as of now. Now our concerns are how do these dry patches of weather translate to impacts and as we can see in the uh, the soil moisture maps um, starting to impact is quite considerably. This is the one day average four inch plant available water basically how much uh, uh, water's in that soil for plants to use in the top four inches so the topsoil and basically the northwestern half of the state again uh, very dry to bone dry um, with a few areas where uh, they've gotten some soaking rains but again that's a, a signal that there are impacts from the, the dry stretch of weather over the last week to going out to 60 to 90 days. And then if we look down farther for the entire 32 inch column uh, from the topsoil on down um, again we can see that northwestern part of the state down into to, to southwest Oklahoma, uh, s drawn down into central Oklahoma, uh, very dry, that, so that soil column uh, has been impacted by the long-term dryness, uh, again down to 32 inches. So we need rainfall, what else is new, right? But unfortunately it is summer, um, a time when evaporation does tend to outpace uh, our moisture uh, from precipitation. So hopefully we can get some summer storms in here a little bit wider scale over the next couple of weeks, start to tamp down a little bit on this dry weather. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. One of the stops at the Summer Forge Field Day was over this crop that's making its way into Oklahoma. It's called Teff. Now, Heath, kind of introduce us to Teff. Okay, so um, Teff production, Teff management, um, actually, uh, you know, was originated in Ethiopia. It's actually used to feed two thirds of their population over there as a grain crop. Right. And we kind of started looking more towards as forage production uh, in, in this area. Uh, and, and I know Brian Pugh in Northeast, uh, which is my counterpart, has done a lot of work uh, with TEF over the last few years. What, what makes TEF so, such a great crop for, for cattle? Well, you know, we're finding out more and more things about TEF and, and how it fits in uh, with, with a, maybe a producer's operation. Right. Uh, but the protein is around, you know, is run around 16 percent crude mm -hmm. protein. Uh, TDN's around 60, 62 um, percent. It's actually a pretty high quality forage, qu high quality forage hay right. uh, that guys are looking at in order to grow some fast hay. And, and one of the secrets to that is you really don't plant it that deep. Seeding depth with TEF, you know, TEF is an extremely small seed mm -hmm. and, and so we've got to be able to have a really good seed bed uh, prepared and ready to go and then basically plant that TEF around an eighth of an inch. So generally about if it's planted into good moisture or say we get a light rain within you know, around three days, it's starting to starting to to, uh, to germinate and emerge, uh, and it sits there for quite a while, and it just kind of sits there, and then all of a sudden, it grows. Uh, and I think we're at that stage here right now where it's really taking off and really getting that with the program. Now, you planted this in the beginning of June. Is is that the prime planting area, or so, is there? Uh, Teff can be planted any time after the last frost. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, ground temperatures need to be uh, high enough or warm enough in order to get it germinated and growing. So the warmer it is, the quicker it's going to come out of the ground uh, and, and germinate and start growing. Are, are, are you seeing more success with a conventional till or maybe a no-till program? Uh, everything that we've looked at, uh, and, and, and Teff being such a small seed, mm -hmm. uh, we really need to be able to see the soil. If you right. can see the soil, then you're going to get better uh, emergence and get, and get it up and, and, and get it going. So no-till production systems, I think, can be done, mm -hmm. but we have to have minimal, minimal residue out there uh, in, in order to get that uh, established and get it going. In some forages, there's nitrate issues. Do we see that with TEF? 
At, so, from what we're finding out, the literature says there's no nitrate issues with TEF management. We did have some trials in northwest Oklahoma uh, that did indicate some levels of nitrate uh, in, into the samples. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're still evaluating that, but just to, for me, I don't, if you look at the, the, the plant and the way it grows and its characteristics, I just don't think it's going to be that big of an, it's going to be an issue. It shouldn't. I, I would say it's going to be more similar uh, how you would manage Bermuda grass. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are taking this to forage and we're going to cut and bale it, mm -hmm. we've got to leave, you know, three to four inches, you know, better to leave four of growth and not skim the ground because when we do that, then that pretty much eliminates our stored carbohydrates in that root system and it just, it, it, it wants to die, it'll die out on us. So so you can actually get a second cutting off of this? You can get a second cutting and you know, if it's managed properly, you may even be able to get a third cutting, but that goes back to different levels of management, you know, proper height of cutting, fertility. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, TEF is really, pretty nitrogen use efficient mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to uh, making the amount of forage with what nitrogen it has in the soil or what you apply. Uh, around 30 pounds of nitrogen will make uh, a ton of forage. Mm -hmm. So that's really efficient to, to me being a summer annual crop like this. Efficient fertility, efficient moisture usage too? It has the ability to tolerate the drought mm -hmm. along with the monsoon flooding that we will have here in Oklahoma. So, you know, you kind of get the, you, you kind of have those periods in there that it's, it's kind of suited for that. It will tolerate some standing water and it's going to tolerate some drought and, and heat and stuff like that as well. Uh, but the main thing is having some moisture there in order for it to, to replenish once you know we pull the tonnage off of there. Okay, well thank you much Heath. And for more information on TEF, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Finally today, Curtis Hare introduces us to a Tulsa County grower that takes her freshly grown produce on the road to communities that may not have access to it. A mile or two outside of downtown in North Tulsa, you'll find something out of the ordinary for a part of the city known for poverty and boarded up buildings. A farm. It keeps away insects too, so it's a natural um, defense. This is Katie. She's taking advantage of the cooler weather the rain brought to pick some tomatoes. We grow a little bit of everything. We kind of follow the season. We do have hoop houses, so we're able to grow lettuces and kales and things like that um, throughout the winter. Katie moved to Oklahoma in 2009, and about three years ago, her and her partner Scott moved on about five acres of land in North Tulsa. If it seems odd to start a farm in an urban area, let alone one of the more poverty-stricken areas in the city, it's not for Katie and Scott. It makes perfect sense because they started their farm to tackle a problem that's spreading throughout Oklahoma, food deserts. Food deserts in rural and, and urban places are across not only Oklahoma, but the whole country. Um, the issue with uh, urban areas is the lack of transportation is number one. Um, if you don't have a car and the nearest grocery store is 10 miles away, it's really hard to walk to that grocery store. We're in the heart of one right here in North Tulsa. Uh, the, the quote that really got us moving was uh, we were talking with a lady who said she had an easier time finding a gun than an apple in her neighborhood. Katie came up with an ingenious idea. If communities don't have access to grocery stores, why not bring a grocery store to the communities? She and Scott turned a nearly 30-foot horse trailer into a mobile grocery store. We go around the city. Uh, we serve a lot of senior living facilities and disabled facilities. They really have mobility problems. It's not just transportation. They have actual physical mobility problems. What we hope to achieve with this store is to prove that there is demand and need and sustainable operation for small stores in food desert areas. The store has about 750 products, including fresh produce from Katie and Scott's farm. Scott says none of this would be possible without Katie. The thing about Katie is she just has a really big heart. Katie's passion about her community and the place where she lives, she finds, I believe, that, that 
doing this is going to make the biggest impact on making our city a better place to be for everybody down the road. The mobile grocery store will hit about 18 locations throughout Tulsa, and all the work that Katie's been doing has earned her some significant recognition. The Significant Women in Ag program is a collaborative program between the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry and Oklahoma State University. And really its purpose is to recognize women in all aspects of farming from all 70 to 70 counties around the state. Oklahoma State Assistant Extension Specialist Sarah Seams says the work Katie does is amazing and worthy of the Significant Women in Ag honor. Well, Katie, she's been in Oklahoma a relatively short amount of time working here, but in that short amount of time, she's made a huge impact on both the farming, food security, and food landscape of Oklahoma. It's really exciting that they're even doing this and recognizing women in agriculture because it's really a, in, in history dominated. You think of a man being the farmer, not the woman. So I think it's really great that attention is being brought to the hard work that the women are doing on the farm her work is greatly appreciated. It's a good idea, especially for people who can't get around well. Uh, I've got a bad back, I lose my balance easily, that's why I have this walker. So for me to get up and walk around and, or get out and get somewhere, it's sometimes very difficult. Michael King lives at Sandy Park Community Center. This is the first time Katie's store has made a stop at Sandy Park. It's a lot nicer for some place like this to come and you can't get everything here, of course, you can get a few things. And if it saves you just, you know, one or two trips a week. It's well worth it. In Tulsa County, I'm Curtis Hare. Well, that does it for us this week on SUNUP. If there's something on the show that you'd like to learn more about, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. And while you're there, check out our social media. From the South Central Research Station near Chickasha, I'm Dave Deacon. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at SUNUP.